Um, and uh, we have folks from land trusts, from SWCDs, and many watershed councils are here. We have some related partners as well, so welcome to everybody. Um, this is the third and the final webinar in a series that we started on exploring opportunities for new innovative partnerships related to your work in community and youth education. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to see or review the two webinars that precede this, I encourage you to do it. Uh, June 29, we had an overview of the outdoor education landscape in Oregon and the outdoor ed, uh, school landscape. On August 10, I shared the findings from the work that I did looking into funding alternatives. And um, both of those were recorded and are archived on the Network of Oregon Watershed Council's website. So feel free to uh, click into that and, and you can see both the audio and the video of those recordings. So this third webinar then is really going to drill down more specifically with one sector. And it's a sector that we haven't played with much before. And so uh, it's a new player for many of you, I would, would guess. Um, Bobby Cochran, um, the executive director of the Willamette Partnership, is going to lead us off with an overview of the, this potential and uh, the work that he and his team have done over the last year and over the summer looking into this new potential link between outdoor education and, and the health sector, health providers, and health outcomes. Um, Emily Henke is a project manager from the Oregon Health and Outdoors Initiative, which is a very cool name for an organization I just heard about. Oregon Health and Outdoors An Initiative, and she's with the Oregon Public Health uh, Institute. And Cameron Brown is also with us. He's a recent uh, PSU Master's in Public Health graduate, and he's done much of the heavy lifting on the, the assessment that was done uh, this summer looking at the community health benefits investment, which is a term that I know he's going to be describing what that, what that means uh, with nonprofit hospitals around the state. So um, just a couple of, before I hand it over to Bobby, a couple of housekeeping things. If you want to ask a question or make a comment, and we really hope that you do, you can, you, you should see a little hand icon up in the corner of your screen and you can just click on it and it will indicate to me, I'm, I'm sort of the monitor of these things, uh, that you want to ask a question. So I'll unmute you at that point. Everybody's muted by default to keep the background noise down. But I'll unmute you and welcome you to ask your question. If you don't want to speak uh, but you still want to have a question answered, you can type it in the little question box and I'll be watching that as well. And if it's a question that's appropriate or relevant to everybody, I'll ask it out loud. Uh, if it's just related to trying to get on to the um, technology, then I'll probably just answer it one-on-one. -on -one. But um, So there's two ways. You can speak out by raising your hand or you can type a question in the question box. We also have a couple of poll questions that will um, get you engaged a little bit on, on the presentation. And I think that might be it. I'm going to just hand it over to Bobby to get us started with this uh, conversation. And he has some questions he wants to ask you as well as they would. Uh, they have some things that they want to know about us. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over, Bobby. Great. Thanks so much, Sean. Really appreciate it. And uh, for everybody on the on the phone, thank you for all the the really good work that you're doing. The, the Oregon Conservation Partnership and Watershed Councils and Conservation Districts and Land Trusts and, and the rest are just doing really good stuff throughout the state. So we're, we're happy to be helpful wherever we can. Um, I think for, for Emily and Cameron and I, uh, today we've, we've got a bit of a, a job to do. Uh, part of that is, is to convince you all that you really are public health providers. Um, that a lot of the work that you are doing and can be doing um, can really help make Oregon a healthier state. Um, and then also part of that is um, for those folks who really want to engage with healthcare and engage on, on health, kind of giving you the one-on-one -on, -one on, on how to speak healthcare. Um, they have their own jargon and, and lingo just like we do in the conservation world. Um, and then give you some, some tools um, that, are, that are out there on, on how to make some of those linkages. 
but in exchange, we, we do have some asks for, for you all on the phone. And part of that is to help us understand a little bit on kind of what the status of thinking about health is out in the conservation community in, in Oregon, um, thinking with us about what to do next, how some of the tools we've developed um, are or are not helpful, or how they can be even uh, more useful, and then thinking about next steps on you know how um, we work together statewide on policy to better link health and nature um, or um, in a community in, in John Day or Curry County or, or in the Willamette. So that's a bit of, of what to expect over the, the next little bit. Um, you've got a really fun team um, that, that come together to present this. Um, so Emily and, and Cameron are our public health experts. Um, I'm the conservation guy. Um, and so they've taught me how to speak healthcare, and and uh, I've hope hopefully I've uh, taught them a little bit on how to speak bird and bunny too. Um, so as as we go along, uh, feel free to to ask questions, and we'll intentionally stop in a in a couple of spots um, to be able to um, have a conversation too. But a big reason why Willamette well, Partnership got interested interested in this, we're a conservation organization. Our mission is to expand the pay scope and effectiveness of conservation with benefits for both people and nature. And we realize that if you look at the, the major polls on why people care about the environment, they care about clean air, clean water, and natural places to play. So really they're telling you they care a lot about their health. Um, similarly, we hadn't done enough work on our, on our own thinking about equity and inclusion. And for us, health equity was a really tangible way to, to engage um, because we can't advance health without advancing health equity. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But as we started playing around in this area a little bit more, there's just some really striking stats um, that have gotten us more and more dedicated to advancing health. Um, you know, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation had done a number of studies kind of culminating in a finding that your zip code determines 90% of your health, way more important than your genetic code. Um, so if we're not thinking about how we create healthy places, we're just never gonna advance health. And then similarly, if you look at some of the disparities that are out there in health outcomes, it's really striking. So in South Seattle, um, right there by the airport and the port area, you have life expectancy that's eight years less than in other parts of the city. And in Oregon, if you're American Indian, African American, Latino, or live anywhere in rural Oregon, you're likely to experience much higher incidences of chronic disease. And so we've got a lot of work to do here in Oregon to advance health. And I think there's a lot the conservation community can do to plug in as we're realizing in the health world that we need to look at upstream solutions. And in fact, that's what we're doing in the conservation world too, looking at how do we engage landowners? How do we engage new residents? We're looking at fixing kind of the upstream source problems of water quality or habitat degradation um, and planning for things like climate change. So there's actually a, a ton of parallels between the two communities. And so Emily, I, I wanted to hand it off to you next to, to talk a little bit about um, kind of the factors that affect health and, and what's going on in the health world. Sure, thanks Bobby. Like Sean said, my name is Emily Hanke, and I am the project manager for the Oregon Health and Outdoors Initiative. And I work with the Oregon Public Health Institute, which is a nonprofit public health institute dedicated to improving the health of Oregonians with a particular focus on health equity. So before we launch into a conversation about health in the outdoors, I wanted to start by sort of zooming out and defining health. So in my work, when I talk about health, when I think about health, I like to use the World Health Organization's definition of health, which is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So health is more than just being not sick. So that said, though, when we think about creating health in our own lives, we often confine ourselves to thinking within the walls of a clinic, or a hospital because we go to doctors when we need to get healthy, when we're sick, right? So things like getting advice from your providers, getting prescriptions, medications to treat conditions, those are very important for your health as an individual. But actually the factors that have the biggest influence on our health status as communities and as populations 
are the social and environmental factors, uh, which you see in the bottom two tiers of the pyramid on this slide. So that's things on the bottom level like systemic inequalities, racism, socioeconomic status. All of those affect health and well-being throughout the life course from preconception forward. And when it comes to the environmental context, which is the second from the bottom tier, we're healthier when the healthy choice is the easy choice. So, for example, do you have sidewalks in your neighborhood so you can walk where you need to go rather than drive and incorporate some exercise into your daily life? Does your grocery store carry healthy, appealing, affordable food? Or is it mainly convenience foods, junk foods, candy bars, and like maybe a small pile of overripe bananas at the cash register? So you can see how changing the context in the, um, the social and environmental context has the potential to reach a lot more people than just one doctor telling one patient that she needs to exercise more and eat right. It has the potential instead to touch a whole community or multiple communities of people. So could I have the next slide, please, Bobby? There we go. So it's also important to think bigger than individual health behaviors, doctor visits, and health interventions that target single people. Because like Bobby said, we have serious health disparities in Oregon that we can only address if we work at the bottom of that pyramid on the earlier slide. So on this slide, I have a couple examples of those disparities. And when I say disparities, I mean the differences in health status between groups. So in Multnomah County, for starters, African-American women experience infant mortality at twice the rate of white infant mortality. So that means that um, African-American babies are twice as likely to die before their first birthday as white babies. And unlike with other racial groups, this doesn't improve for African-American women with educational attainment. And what that means is that African-American women with college degrees, with advanced degrees, have worse birth outcomes than white women who did not finish high school. Uh, in Baker County, 32% of residents have no leisure time physical activity compared to 17.5% of Oregonians statewide. Uh, in the Native American community, 17.6% of people have asthma, whereas 11.2% of whites in Oregon have asthma. And in the Latino community, 19% of women have diabetes, and 6.8% of white women have diabetes. So in all of these cases that I just highlighted, and these are you know, just a handful of examples, individual health care, health behaviors, and genetics play a role, certainly, but we will have the greatest impact if we address systemic racism, lack of physical activity in our rural areas, air quality, healthy food access, and other things in the social and environmental context. When we restrict our interventions to the top of that pyramid, to the individual level, we might see improvements in the groups, um, it's rather in the health of those populations, but we don't see the gaps between the groups close. And to close those gaps, we have to work at the bottom of the pyramid because that's where the inequities that produce these differences in health status are rooted. Next slide. And that's why using an equity lens in our work is essential. Health inequities do not happen by accident, and they won't be addressed without intentional work and community leadership. So when we center our work on addressing those inequities, and when I say center our work, I mean everything from analyzing problems to designing solutions, defining our success, evaluating our impact, we can create conditions that allow everybody to reach their full potential, eliminating inequities on the basis of race, class, gender, income, ability, geography, and other characteristics. Next slide. We do, though, have to distinguish equity from equality, and this slide, I think, helps with that. So in the picture, each of the people on the left gets the same number of boxes which are intended to help them reach the apples in the tree, but as you can see, it ultimately does not allow everybody to reach the apple. 
So equality provides each person or each community with the same amount and type of resources regardless of where they're starting from. Equity, on the other hand, and on the other side of the slide, um, gives people different numbers of boxes, in this case the number that they need to reach the apples. So an equity lens, in contrast to equality, recognizes that each person or community doesn't start at the same place and may need different types or amounts of resources to achieve similar outcomes. Some communities need more resources to experience the same outcomes as communities that have historically had better access to more resources and better opportunities. So that is the 50,000 foot overview of um, health and equity, and I'm gonna pass it back to Bobby to talk more about how all of this wraps up with the connection between health and outdoors. Great, thanks a lot, Emily. And and I think the, the looking at the pyramid and the social determinants of health and looking at, at health equity, that really is at the center of a lot of conversations in the healthcare world um, right now. So learning learning that language, learning what it means for for your work um, is important uh, in terms of developing some of those partnerships. Now, in thinking about the links between health and outdoors. Um, there's actually a fair amount of emerging science. In a lot of ways, the science is, is ahead of the practice. Um, and a lot of that has really been uh, popping out in the last five or, or so years. I think as we go through here, I think it might be on the next slide. If not, Sean, we can get you the, the link. There was a recent research agenda that was published in Environmental Health Perspectives that has a really good summary table on the evidence that is linking time out in nature to better health. But in general, there's four areas where we know there's a strong uh, connection. We know that if you're out and there's more closer, safer, cleaner green spaces, you're gonna have greater physical activity. Um, there's evidence that you know, if you're outdoors in a natural environment versus indoors in a, in a gym, um, you're actually getting more physical activity when you're, when you're outdoors in, in nature. Um, a lot of these things that I'm gonna talk about feel intuitive, um, so this next one on improving mental health, you know, if you feel like you're on a river or on top of the mountain or outdoors, you know, you kind of have that sense of awe or you, you feel like you're, you're part of something bigger than yourself. Well, what's actually happening biophysically, now we have some of that research, is when you're on top of that mountain and feeling awe, your cortisol levels are decreasing. And even more so, they're not just decreasing in that moment they're staying low for two or so weeks afterwards. 90 minutes out in the woods um, is showing significant reductions in brooding. And, and brooding is, is a feeling we've all felt. It was actually a really important kind of precursor stage to depression. And so being outdoors in nature is, is reducing stress, it's improving mental health, there's even research um, that's coming out that's talking about potential benefits uh, for addiction treatment, um, and looking at psychosis. Um, we know a lot about how trees clean air and some work that Portland State and Forest Service is doing is making much stronger micro scale um, types of, of measurements. So even um, urban, urban tree canopy or a riparian uh, forest that might be between a neighborhood and, and a road, we can start talking about the reductions in exposure to particulates and nitrogen dioxide. And then the, the last is really strengthening social cohesion. And I think if you think about environmental education, uh, community tree planting, there's a lot that we talk about in conservation about getting to scale of trying to professionalize restoration and, and what have you. But the social cohesion aspects, um, when uh, Emily and I have been talking with community health workers across the state, some of the primary needs that we're hearing a lot about is building stronger supportive social relationships as a precursor to a lot of other health improvement. Um, that if you have good social relationships, your mental health is better. If your mental health is better, your physical activity and your physical health is better. So a lot of these things are, are really closely related. And so there's, there is a fair amount of evidence um, that we can make a strong correlation between time outdoors and improved health, but also to just be really clear, there's a lot we don't know. 
And there are some, some research priorities that we've identified in that environmental health perspectives article that just got published. And some of those, those remaining questions are around what exactly is going on that creates health from time and nature? There's one body of theory that it's a lack of stressors. So when I go outdoors, you know, into the woods, I'm removing myself from the, the things that cause stress in my life. So just reducing stress is the pathway for, for health. Um, there's another, another body of theory that's talking about immune system response, that being outdoors in nature can actually change the microbiome on your body and in your gut. Um, it changes how your immune system responds, um, and that, can, that might be a, a pathway. We just don't know. The other pieces that we don't know yet, um, which we're really anxious to, to get answers to, is kind of what's the dose response? You know, how much nature is enough? How often? Um, this is a picture of one of the Health and Outdoors Initiative pilots at Portland International Raceway with adaptive sports. And so if you're not able to walk or have limited mobility, getting out on a trail or next to a river can be a big barrier. Portland International Raceway actually has a fair amount of green space around it. Um, and so hand cycling is a way that different people can access nature. Is, you know, looking out at nature from Portland International Raceway the same thing as being out in the Wallabo Mountains? We don't know. But those are some of the things we're trying to answer. And similarly, we're working with the city of Seattle right now who says, I'm going to spend a billion dollars on green infrastructure. Can you tell me how to optimize health outcomes from that? We, we're getting close to where we can say high, medium, or low benefits, but we can't say a 10% increase in urban tree canopy is going to lead to a 1% reduction in, in depression. Um, and then I think the, the other body um, of research that needs to get out there that we know um, is important is as, as me being out in the woods by myself, I have a much different experience than say an African-American high school um, kid from North Portland who's never been out in the woods and might think that uh, Forest Park in Portland was never built for him. Um, we might have very different health reactions. So a lot of people talk about you know, love and awe out in nature. Other people talk about fear and snakes and nervousness. Um, and so those really do affect what the health benefits can be. And then I think finally looking at best practices for, for programs. So if you're going to redesign your, your education programs for health, what kind of guidelines and best practices can we give you to optimize for um, you know, reducing stress or improving physical activity or um, kind of dealing with some of the, the early stages that might lead to potential problems with suicide in, in your community. Uh, so those are, those are all areas that we're still working on. But we're pretty sure there's enough, enough information to act now. And, and the science community is, is saying that, that if you think about a prescription drug for heart disease, there may be other side effects that affect your liver or what have you. There aren't that many side effects from taking time in nature. Um, and so we wanted to kind of shift here a little bit to talking about how you can link your work to community health needs. And Cameron's going to go into to more specifics, but just in terms of some of the areas that are going to be um, operating uh, where you are. Every hospital in the country um, has a community health needs assessment, and so does every county public health department. And that community health needs assessment outlines what the community health needs are as formed by heavy input from the community. So that's a great place to start to figure out, you know, if you're in the Lucky Mute watershed, what are the biggest community health needs um, that have been identified? There's also over 300 community health workers um, around, around the state. Community health workers is a specific position. Um, it can be everything from navigating healthcare systems, uh, there's community health workers on transportation boards in the Columbia Gorge. Uh, there's community health workers that are uh, helping start up community gardens. But community health workers are a great place to, to start in terms of how to engage with um, communities around health. Each region has a health equity coalition um, that can talk about what some of the health disparities are um, and help kind of apply an equity lens. And then finally, um, Every nonprofit hospital and coordinated care organization in Oregon 
invest money in what they call community benefits. They have to do that to maintain their nonprofit status, um, and sometimes those funds can be pretty significant. And so we'll talk a, a little bit more about um, where some of those funds are, are being spent and, and how that works. So let's um, stop there just really quickly because we've given you an overview of kind of what's going on with health, what some of the evidence around health and, and nature are. And for us, we were, we were curious you know, how many of the folks on the phone are already working with health providers? Um, so, you know, is that yes, you, you are, no, or not sure? So, Sean, is the, are yeah. you able to get the poll up? The poll is up and people are voting, so it'll, I can Great. see they're coming. Right now, it looks like the majority um, is not, uh, has a, is answering no. So uh, it looks like votes have stopped and 21% are saying yes, 64% no, and 14% are saying they're not sure. Okay. Well, great. Well, um, I'm, I think this is also a pretty good spot, Sean, to, to stop and see if, if any questions are, are coming in and, and open it up a, a little bit before we, we dive into the second half on kind of what's actually happening on the ground here in Oregon uh, to connect health and nature. Yeah, so if anybody has a comment or question at this point, just go ahead and raise your hand and I'll unmute you. For those of who, who said yes, what are some of the things that you're already doing? Love to hear. I have a question. Are there any studies on the benefits of clean water? Um, you know, I don't know. Um, and so, because there's the clean water in terms of what you're drinking, um, but clean water, just say knowing that the Willamette River is clean enough to swim in, what does that mean for overall levels of, of stress? Um, I don't know, but let me put that on my list to, to look. Certainly that's not where a lot of the conversation is, rests. Um, so in terms of having clean water and what the health benefits are, not not directly beyond the normal stuff of, you know, lead in drinking water is bad for you. So more on the toxicology side, yes, there's stuff. Um, but in terms of thinking about the social determinants, I'm not I'm not aware of, of any. Cameron or, or Emily, do you know? Also don't know. No, I also don't know beyond like Bobby said, toxicology and epidemiology of keeping, you know, water clean of cholera and, and you know, other kind of basic public health intervention stuff like that. Yeah, the way we've been talking about it in uh, the Jade District in East Portland or up in Seattle is that more canopy and more green space, we can create measurable improvements for mental health and physical activity but those same investments are also improving uh, storm water quality and improving water quality. So it's not a direct relationship between clean water and health, but the action you're taking to improve water uh, quality is also improving health for other reasons. We have another question, Bobby, um, or a comment from Clinton at Long Tom. We have partnered with local clinics on facilities projects mostly, just like other stakeholders. That's great. So you mean like uh, partnering with a clinic to do restoration restoration work at the facility site? I'm going to unmute you, Clinton, and let's see if I can find you. Okay, you're unmuted, Clinton. Are you there? I guess he's... We'll have to take up a conversation with him after. That sounds yeah. that sounds good. Well, Sean, should we are you getting other questions or should we kind of keep cruising here? Uh, let's see. 
if I can see if there's any more. Um, I don't see any. Oh, yes. HIV Alliance being the principal one we've worked with, we also coordinated on shared goals for community health with communicating about the facility-related project. Oh, that's Clinton. Um, okay. Oh, that is a very limited engagement, he says. Uh, another question, what is, what is there any health thought on the benefits of clean fish, as in fish that rural folks would eat? Yeah, Emily, do you want to? Do you want to take a, a run at that one? I can talk about some of the fish consumption standards and conversations around around mercury and, and toxics, but do you have anything? Yeah, I would, to? no, that one and just say, you know, we've had, and Bobby and I have, have talked about this, you know, over the last, what, 18 months or so with regard to the Willamette River, but it's important to think about, like the, the question alludes to who is fishing in, um, waterways that have fish in various states of, of health. So, um, you know, it might be that we have, for example, in Portland, um, people who are fishing in the Willamette River for fish to eat are typically from minority communities. So we um, have to consider the equity impacts of, of fishing happening on our, on our river. But yeah, go ahead, Bobby. Yeah. I I think part of it, there's, there's certainly a lot of conversations around fish consumption standards that were, were changed a couple of years ago and what that means for, you know, levels of mercury or other emerging contaminants of concern. But I think Emily's point is a really good one that there's folks who fish for fun and there's folks who fish for protein and for a, a key part of, of meat in their diet. Um, and for those, those communities, um, the biggest risk is, you know, resident resident fish and kind of fish that spend a lot of time on the ground. Um, and so the conversation there that Emily had mentioned around making the healthy choice the easy choice, you can't just say don't eat fish. You've got to be thinking about, well, what are the other protein options um, in, in the diet? How do you do that in a culturally relevant way so that if it's, uh, folks from the Latino community or the Slavic community or um, just longtime uh, residences um, around, you know, a dry lakes um, basin. Um, have, how do you advance the conversation around what some of the, the root causes of why people are, are eating unhealthy fish? Um, but then thinking about, well, how can we actually create healthier fish so that you can, you can eat those? Yeah, those are all great conversations to be having. Um, and one we're happy to follow up on and learn a little bit more from you on. Here's one more question. Are funders who have traditionally limited their portfolios to community health, public health, um, et cetera, beginning to consider conservation environmental work as factors linked to those outcomes? If so, which ones, and how much overlap is there with the kind of work that watershed councils traditionally do, which is outreach and education related to the importance of restoration enhancement, habitat, uh, habitat health, water quality improvement to coalesce community support for those activities. So the purpose of the outreach is to get community support for those activities. Is there overlap, uh, is that overlap minimal, uh, sorry, if that overlap is minimal, what are the content areas these funders are looking to, to the conservation community to stretch in to accomplish shared health ecological goals? Uh -huh. Yeah, Emily, do you want to do you want to start on that one? Um, you know, I, I certainly can. I'm wondering if it's a good segue to hand off to Cameron, though. So. Yeah, I think it, I think that is a good one. Um, so Cameron's going to talk about particularly hospital community benefit spending, which we think is is one of the most promising areas for. Uh, watershed watershed groups to be looking into, um, but it's going to take some work um, uh, to get get in get that moving. Um, and we can talk a little bit. About that. Let's uh, let's circle back down to that one at the end because I think there's some conversation around where some of the foundations and 
and uh, some of the other funding organizations might be going on this too. So, Sean, is it okay if we if we move over to to Cameron and get get started sure. talking about what some of the community health needs and where some of the community benefit spending is going already? You bet. There's a couple more examples that people have uh, listed about their their involvement. So if we have time at the end, we can we can share those. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. Well, Cameron, why don't we hand it over to to you to talk about kind of what you found when you were looking at how hospitals are are spending their money and and the connections between um, time out time outdoors and what they're doing. Sure. Thanks, Bobby. So again, my name is Cameron Brown, and um, just in June, I finished my master's in public health program at Portland State University. So as part of my field experience for that program, I started to look at um, reviewing all the health priorities that were established by hospitals and county health departments all over Oregon. And then I continued that research through the summer up until just a few weeks ago to look at the, the entire state. So this map you can see here um, it has every nonprofit hospital, and it's kind of a great um, just geographic locator for them. And it's important because every one of these hospitals had to produce one of those community health needs assessments that Bobby already mentioned. Now, those needs assessments, it's, um, it's partly health professionals that are reviewing secondary data, but it's also, there's a big community input um, portion for these CHNAs. So there's um, phone interviews, focus groups, community listening sessions to try to balance out the, who's giving input and establishing these health priorities. So when we go to this next slide, um, we'll see what the top priorities were across the state. And um, you can see across the board that it was hospitals and county health departments that mental health issues and access to services and just uh, the high prevalence of mental health issues in Oregon was the top um, both community-driven and kind of health professional driven need um, statewide. And then uh, kind of in the middle you'll see three interrelated health issues that center around chronic conditions. And so examples of those are like diabetes, uh, asthma, cardiovascular disease. And um, you can see the relation between physical activity, more activity, generally um, better health outcomes for chronic conditions. And then, of course, there's the link between um, weight-related health issues and obesity kind of compounding uh, what you see with chronic health outcomes. So those were, um, again, very common across the board, county health departments and hospitals. And uh, it should be noted that there's some other health priorities that were common, but that don't really have a direct link to, the, to health and outdoors. So I didn't include those. And some of those would be like access to dental health care or access to our primary health care providers. But these really relevant issues that we're seeing um, kind of rounded out by the child and maternal health priority. And there is some emerging research that um, neighborhoods with more green space, more tree canopy, um, that babies born in those neighborhoods have a higher birth weight than neighborhoods with less green space or tree canopy. So you can see these are pretty much the top five health issues that have some relevance to health and outdoors that the community health needs assessments established across Oregon. So when we see the next slide, um, hospitals are also required to invest in community benefit spending and programs. So these are some health programs that might not be continued if they were just evaluated on a financial basis alone but the, the hospital keeps them going because they're um, providing community health benefit um, to communities that are experiencing health disparities, like Emily already talked about. And so these, um, these numbers you're seeing for the different regions of Oregon, um, the number in black is the top, it's like the total community benefit numbers. So some of that includes research, uh, training, but the number beneath it in orange, in parentheses, that's the number that's being invested specifically in those community health programs um, for disadvantaged communities. And so, of course, uh, Willamette Valley region is going to have the largest numbers. It's a large cl cluster of hospitals and kind of where all the health uh, infrastructure is in Oregon. And then um, you can also see the top uh, um, health issues here just with an icon. And I think Bobby already went over those. The hammock is um, 
spending time outdoors increases mental health. Um, and then the um, being active outdoors, good for chronic conditions, weight related issues, etc. And so you can see that the five O web regions, the coast, southwest, Atlanta Basin, Mid Columbia, and Eastern Oregon, they all have really similar top priorities, except down in that south central region, you can see the um, two people planting a tree together. And that was the sense of community or social cohesion icon. So that was a kind of unique um, health priority for that central Oregon region was the sense of community connectedness. Um, but again, in general, we're seeing chronic conditions, mental health as the top health issues across the regions. And um, so these community benefit dollars, they're, um, they're spent so people can try to, we can try to address these top health needs. Um, for example, in the Willamette Valley, uh, Salem Hospital right now is helping to fund a group called Just Walk Salem. And it's a community walking group. Some of their walks are not held in parks, but some of them are in natural areas around Salem. So already we're seeing some um, recognition and investment from Salem Hospital in terms of health and outdoors. Uh, on the coast, Providence Seaside Hospital has already started to fund free access to low-income families to access state parks and natural areas around the coast. And then finally, down in Southern Oregon, uh, Klamath County area, Sky Lakes Hospital is also funding monthly hikes with health professionals just to, um, to get people outdoors and also to start a discussion about the health benefits of, of spending time outdoors. So again, just to conclude, we're seeing that hospitals have prioritized some health issues that we know that there's evidence for spending time outdoors improves these health issues. And we already see that some hospitals are investing in um, community health programs outdoors. So the interest is certainly there, but it's, it's very nascent and it's just sort of um, blossoming. So I think I'll turn it back over to Bobby now to talk about kind of how this relates to what Health and Outdoors Initiative is doing on the ground in Oregon. Great, thanks Cameron. And I think um, just as I was listening to you, you talk, it reminded me, um, you know, the, like how, how would folks actually get access to these community benefit dollars at a, at a local hospital? And, you know, I'll, often there is an individual at the hospital that's in charge of community benefit spending um, or engaging in community health. Um, there's not often a big open kind of request for proposals that come out. Some of the coordinated care organizations might do that. Um, and for folks who don't know, the coordinated care organizations is how Oregon uh, delivers our Medicaid programs. Um, but if, if folks have particular interest in how they might access some of these community benefit dollars, we're happy to help figure out how we can help you make a, a connection into your, your local hospital on, on some of these. But when asking about funding, this, this seems to be one of the, the biggest sources, and it's, it's a place that's shifting increasingly to those dollars being spent a little bit less on uh, things like uh, free emergency room care and a little bit more on community health investment. Bobby, we have a question from Mike Running. Mike, I'm going to unmute you and let you ask your question. Oh, uh, hi, this is Mike Running with the Coalition of Oregon Land Trust. This has been really an interesting presentation, so many thanks to you three. Um, one of my questions uh, actually was largely answered by Cameron, but maybe Cameron, you can go into a little bit more detail um, just about those community health needs assessments and any ways that conservation groups can be um, kind of involved in providing either input or talking about opportunities to meet those needs. Um, and then kind of a related question, just a quick clarification about these community benefit spending dollars. Is this overall these numbers or these annual spending uh, uh, totals? Thanks. Sure. Um, just the, the simple um, question, those are the annual um, spending dollars for each region. So, and then, ah, and then, um, for the community health needs assessments, they're, they're produced every three years or so. So there's, I think there's recurring opportunity for collaboration. And um, just looking at, they, they have a big list of partners, each, each um, assessment they produce. 
And a lot of the partners are in the health uh, sector, but you know, I see people from all over, all over the board. Um, you see a lot of the tribal health clinics and um, tribal governments as partners. So I think that I think that there is certainly an opportunity to reach out and um, see if there's interest in the next um, the next round of community health needs assessments. Chairman, I would also just jump in to add that in a lot of our hospitals, health departments, and coordinated care organizations, the community health needs assessment, or sometimes it's just called a community health assessment, is a precursor to another process called a community health improvement plan. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, the opportunity for outside groups to have input is actually at the community health improvement plan stage. And um, that's when they look at the data and, and decide, okay, what are the priorities and what are we going to do with it? What are we going to spend our money on and what are we going to organize around? Where is their interest in the community? So that's another place you can plug in. So if you see in your region that the community health needs assessment has already happened last year, it doesn't mean that the opportunity is not there to get involved. Um, I think it, it might actually be a stronger argument if you can look at some of the the data in the needs assessment and say, you know, here's a way we can contribute to resolving this problem. Um, there are lots of opportunities to do that, especially I think as we see public health departments going through accreditation processes. To be accredited at the national level, they have to go through some pretty rigorous um, needs assessment processes, like Cameron was saying, and also these community health improvement planning processes where they're required to do good community engagement. So that is um, a, a real door, and um, that's you know that's where I would show up for the first time if I were if I were looking for an opportunity to get involved. Yeah, and I think just to draw an analogy, um, the community health needs assessment are kind of like an, an OWEB strategic plan. The community health improvement plans are like the grant criteria. So. Um, and Cameron, would it be fair to say that in your read of the community health needs assessment, um, was there any community health needs assessment that you didn't see an avenue in for, for conservation to be talking about outdoor education or, or restoration or other, other types of programmatic investments? No, I think every community health needs assessment has the potential connection. Um, partly because they are so broad and they consider such a huge range of health issues from the individual all the way up to the built environment, access to recreation opportunities. Um, I think that's definitely opportunities. Yeah, so I think that underscores Emily's point that the community health improvement plan is, is a great place to engage. And then, so Cameron, you didn't mention that your review of, of all, you know, 107 community health needs assessments is in a database um, that yeah. we will publish. We just, it's hot off the presses and we just haven't figured out the best way to make it available. But um, you have all, do you have the information on the date that the CHNAs were developed? I do, yes. Okay. So Mike, we have, we have that for every community in every part of Oregon, and you can see whether it's, it's supposed to be coming up for renewal next year or, or two years from now. I've been on mute, but you, if I wasn't on mute, you'd hear me cheering. <laughs> this is awesome. I have some more comments. Uh, this is Sean. Uh, this is probably related to a comment before, but uh, someone said, I would add that having clean, swimmable waters in your neighborhood offers that direct access to physical and mental health. And um, somebody also said, we've recently partnered with the NeighborWorks Umpqua on a project where they acted as a fiscal sponsor for a farm to school grant that enabled us to bring in a food core service member to assist with expanding our food sheds program, which focuses on introducing kids to local food and how food production is tied to watershed health. Awesome. Mike, do you still have a question? Your hand is still up. Uh, I don't want to 
ignore you if you still have something you want. Oh, he popped it down. Okay, great. And I don't well, want to go ahead, Bobby. I was just going to respond on the, the umqua, um, I, and I I think one of the things that we're interested in is we're is there are these examples out there, is how do we communicate that out into the broader world that these things are existing and what kind of gaps or support do you need, for example, around measuring health outcomes or, or um, you know, being part of a broader network of people working on other things. So just as something to think about for next steps, how can we best support um, the work you all are already doing? So Sean, do you want us to keep on keep on moving here? Yeah, we have about seven minutes uh, left, so I would press on if you've got some. You have another poll too, I remember. <laughs> yeah, and I think this is. The, I'll I'll kind of go quickly through some of these. This has been good discussion, but we also this this next set of slides is about what's actually going on. Um, and so, Oregon Public Health Institute and Willamette Partnership and a number of other folks put together an Oregon Action Framework that describes what some of the priority actions are in terms of we need more, more green stuff, um, we need better access to that existing green stuff, and we need culturally relevant programming that um, makes sure that that green stuff is, is welcoming and accessible to everyone. And um, that's available at oregon.healthandoutdoors.org, so I encourage folks to look at that. But that's the, the plan that's guiding a lot of Emily and Cameron and my work on this stuff. So some of the other programs that, that we've um, helped launch, um, the pilot programs are all really community-led. And in general, we're trying to get a community health worker or some, some equivalent um, kind of health provider to, to lead a lot of these. So Latin Explorers is a program that recently won a Society for Outdoor Recreation uh, Professionals Award. Uh, it was funded by REI and the local hospital um, and rather than uh, training the Friends of the Gorge on how to engage with the Latino community, the Sierra Club and Latino Outdoors trained community health workers on how to be outdoor leaders. Um, and so that program is getting folks outdoors and we're looking at, at measuring some of the overall outcomes. And that's in the Columbia Gorge. You know, some of the other pilot programs that are, that are up and going, um, Hike It Baby, um, is a program for new moms. It's a program that's actually available everywhere, but two chapters were explicitly uh, started um, in Baker and Wallawa County, which has one of the highest cancer clusters. And so it's really, it's being funded by the Knight Cancer Center um, to kind of advance um, physical activity. Um, Adaptive Sports Portland was that picture of the hand cycling uh, program. Um, and then talking with the Black Parent Initiative about a program uh, for, for doulas um, and spending time outdoors with expectant mothers is one of the other programs that we're talking about. Those are some of the, the community-specific um, actions, but we're also looking at kind of statewide supporting initiatives. So Oregon Public Health Institute um, is the lead for a campaign called Healthy Eating Active Living Cities, so a heal city. And for those heal cities, they adopt uh, they can adopt a menu of different policy alternatives. And Emily was successful in getting some nature and outdoor interventions into that heal city policy menu. So in your local community, one of the things we might work on together is can we make that community a heal city or think about health and all policy? I mentioned the research agenda that we published. We're now trying to figure out how we get some of that research funded and moved out and kind of driven by communities. And the last one um, that I think is also relevant to this conversation is um, Emily and I put together a guideline for outdoor educators on how to improve health. Um, and that's available on um, the oregon.healthandoutdoors.org or the OPHI uh, website as well. And then I think the, the final piece is there's also an economic case to make here that if you look at outdoor recreation and time outdoors and nature, it's good for health, but it's good for business too. Um, outdoor recreation is a $12.8 billion industry in Oregon with 141,000 jobs in almost every community in, in Oregon. And their biggest growth is in kind of more lifestyle of I'm gonna wear your gear just to be outside every day 
rather than going kite surfing uh, three times a year. Um, so there's a really strong, I think, alliance there between conservation health and outdoor recreation that at the state level um, we should be cultivating and exploring. So I think in, in closing, you know, I think the five things that you can do to advance health um, are just get your local community health worker, or hospital administrator, or doctor, and just take them out for a coffee or a walk on one of your restoration projects just so they understand why that's a health intervention. I think our, in talking with healthcare, this stuff is just not really on a lot of their radar screen, um, but once it is, it stays there. Um, and then, I, but I think before you ask for healthcare money, um, you've got to get serious about health equity within your own organization and really be thinking about not how can you fund what I'm already doing, but how can I do things differently um, to better meet community health needs. Um, and then I think the cross-sector collaboration is, is really doable between health, education, um, and a number of the different sectors. And so we're interested in as many good examples that you can point us to actions we can take to support you. And I think that's the last poll that um, we wanted to put out there is, you know, what, what kinds of things could we do together next? Um, let's figure something out together in your local community. Um, we need help measuring the health benefits of the work. Um, help me make a connection to the local hospital or community health workers, which we can do. And then think about best practices for how to improve health. And then, you know, I put my email and my phone number down here, but, you know, Cameron and Emily and I are completely, completely open and happy to support you in any way we can. Um, and then if you really are excited about what you're hearing, Cameron is also looking for work. He just graduated. Um, he's based there in the, in the Eugene area and is one of the, the best kind of bridge builders I know around, around linking health and, and the environment. So I think with, with that, Emily or Cameron, do you have any kind of closing thoughts you want to share with the group before we open it up for some last questions? I don't think so. Just interested to see what the poll results are and to say, um, on my end, actually, connecting you with a community health worker in your area is one of the easier things that I can do. So let us know if that's of interest to you because we are set up with the professional organization that serves as a network of community health workers. Yeah, and I think Bobby summed it up pretty well. And um, just from my own research, I think that this is a great um, kind of collaboration and it could produce some really fruitful health benefits for some of those vulnerable communities in Oregon. So I'm excited. Fantastic. Okay, here's some results of the poll. We do also have a question about contact information for you. And as soon as the poll is closed, that, that slide will be revealed again with your email address on it. Uh, okay, 45% said give me a call. 73% help me measure. 73% uh, can, said connect me to the local hospital, and 73% said give me best practice. 67% oh, said, said give me best practices. So an overwhelming response, I would say. And that's just the folks who are on this. Think of everybody else who's, uh, who's going to be looking at this later. So. Well, Mike and, Mike and Sean, I think uh, then we have some, some work to do on how we best provide technical assistance and do some follow-up then, eh? Absolutely. I think this is just the beginning of, of uh, building this relationship. Um, it answered, you answered one of my questions, Emily, that came up, which was how, how to find out who the community health workers are and who do they work for? Who are their employers? Right. So um, the Oregon Public Health Institute actually is the fiscal sponsor of the Oregon Community Health Worker Association, which is keeping track of who's doing community health worker and aligned work in Oregon. And uh, that's an easy connection for us to make. If you're interested, we can um, probably set you up with a connection in your region. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate, as I'm sure everybody else does, the very practical first steps that you outlined. Uh, and everybody wonders, well, how do I get started with this? Walking into this big room. And uh, you, you offered some very, very practical first steps, so very much appreciated. So I'm just going to wait one more second to see if there's any other questions or comments that came up uh, before we end this. 
Um, I do have a comment from Clinton from a long time, from way back in the conversation saying, yes, we, we've done work with stormwater uh, with health providers. <clears throat> so, all right, I'm not seeing any more. I'm confident that this is really the beginning, and I want to thank uh, Cameron and Emily and, and Bobby so much for offering to do this and for getting us all excited about um, this new direction for, for these organizations and, and us. So um, maybe we'll end there, and I'll touch bases with you three um, off, offline. Oh, here's a, one last question. Are there resources available to aid conservation organizations in planning for how to engage with public health? So you mentioned the guide for outdoor educators. Do you want to advertise that one more time, Bobby? Yeah, so there's a guide for outdoor education to improve improve health, and that's available at oregon.healthandoutdoors.org. And I think uh, Sean uh, put up the PowerPoint slides, um, and so that link is is in there. Um, but I I think that that question goes to a conversation that Emily and Cameron and I are actively having, which is how can we best provide technical assistance to organizations who want to engage on public health and health equity. Um, and so we could use some advice on what what best to do that. Is, is that a four-hour consultation with, with Emily and I to help, you know, customize a strategy? Is it, you know, a two-page set of principles? Is it, you know, a 10-page guide? Um, we could use some help figuring out how best to do that because that's a path we're going down, which is, you know, how for a, a restoration group or a conservation group, what can you do? If you're a water or wastewater utility, how can you do that? Um, and so we're really interested in giving those sector-specific guidelines on, on how to be public health providers. We just need to know what best way to deliver that information to you is. All right. Thank you again. Um, we'll we'll keep trying to answer that question as we as we talk internally. So, uh, all right. It is after 11. I'm going to close this off now. Stop the recording and um, thank you. I'm getting some thank yous coming in um, on the question box. Thank you, everybody, for participating, and we'll we'll be in touch. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.